Hi, everybody. I'm going to start in just a minute. There's folks filling the room right now. And um, once we get maybe another few seconds, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Linda Mitchell, CEO for Allergy and Asthma Network. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We're in for a real treat today with Dr. Dave Stupis as the presenter. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started on today's program. First, all participants will be on mute today for the webinar. We will be and are recording the webinar right now. Um, and so we will post the link to the recording on our website after the webinar in a couple of days. You can find all of our recorded webinars on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Scroll to the bottom of the page of our homepage, and you will find all of our webinars and the recordings um, along with any up upcoming webinars. This webinar will be one hour in length, and that includes times for Q&A. We will take those questions at the end, and we hope to get to all of them, but at any time during today's session, you can go ahead and enter the questions in the question box, and we will monitor them and save them for the Q&A session at the end. We do not offer continuing education credits for today's webinar. We do offer a certificate of attendance, um, and so you, you can ask for one of those for your records. A few days after the webinar, you will receive an email with a list of supplemental materials and a link to the download with a certificate of attendance. You will also try, you can also try to, we will also try to enter the link to the certificate in the chat box, but sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So let's get started. What can we do if a student has an asthma attack? That's what we'll talk about today, first starting with asthma basics. Today, it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dave Stukas. Dr. Dave is a professor of clinical pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. He's also the Associate Program Director of the Pediatric Allergy and Immunology Fellowship Training Program at Nationwide, and he's the Director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center at Nationwide. I have to tell you, before taking over as director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center, Dr. Dave was a director or co-director, I can't remember quite which, of the Severe Asthma Clinic at Nationwide. He can clarify that for you when he gets started. Dr. Dave is also the social media editor for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and he's the Quad AI's podcast moderator at all. You may be familiar with Dr. Dave from Twitter and Instagram as Allergy Kids Doc, where he's active in his personal mission to address misinformation with evidence-based information and with a dose of humor too. So Dr. Dave, you and I haven't done a webinar in a long time, but, um, but I really am excited for you to be here today and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Linda. And, and thank you all for joining today on, on this afternoon. And Lindy and I, we've known each other for, oh my gosh, 15 years, if not longer, uh, but it has been a while since we've had the chance to work together. So um, thanks for the kind invitation. Um, I don't, do you want to go through anything with the mission of the Allergy and Asthma Network before I get going? Um, sure. I, I, the mission of the Allergy and Asthma Network is to end the needless death and suffering due to allergy, asthma, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. We advance our mission through the lens of health equity, and our key health equity program is our Trusted Messengers program, um, where we do outreach events into local communities, and then we in, invite people to enroll in our free virtual asthma coaching program. I thought I'd mention that since this is all about asthma today. Yeah, excellent. All right. Well, here are my goals uh, for today is I really want to help demystify asthma, especially in the school setting. I, there's a lot of sort of outdated thoughts in regards to asthma, lots of misconceptions that we'll address. And uh, my goal really is to make this more comfortable for all of you in recognizing and treating asthma. 
ultimately, what does that do? It improves the lives of, of students and children and uh, helps their families and uh, basically makes your life less stressful. So uh, I'm going to do my best to kind of, you know, make this as, as easy as possible because it really is relatively straightforward when you think about it. But there's a lot of nuance as well. So why are we here? Why are we talking about asthma? Well, we know that it is pretty much the most common chronic health condition affecting children uh, of all ages across the world. In certain segments, up to you know 10 to 15% of children have asthma. Uh, so in the average classroom, um, you, you're going to have a student, at least you know one to three students with asthma, if not more, depending upon where you're located and where you live. And it's not just that they have this common chronic health condition, but it is a leading cause of emergency department visits, hospitalizations, missed school days for adults, missed work days. Uh, when people don't have well-controlled asthma, they don't feel well, they don't participate in activities, uh, and it, it, it can impact so many factors of their health. So it's a really big deal. And unfortunately, it impacts millions and millions of people. We always have to talk about disparities, and with asthma, um, they're huge. Uh, we know that it can affect every race and every age, but it is much more common, and not only more common, it's more severe. There's probably a different types of phenotypes and, and different factors that influence the severity of asthma uh, in certain minority populations, those who come from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds, and those who live in urban environments as well. Uh, so if you have students in, that come from those backgrounds, we want to pay particularly attention to them. Uh, but then again, we have to go back and say, well, it really impacts everybody. Uh, so um, yeah, it, it's important to recognize that. What is asthma? Let's just go back to the basics. So there's a couple key words that I put on this slide that I want people to think about. Asthma is chronic. It's not that really bad cough or pneumonia you had that one time. These are symptoms that come back over and over and over again. At the root of asthma, it's down inside the lower airways. Uh, there's inflammation. So it's kind of like a sunburn on the inside of the airways. For some people, they have significant inflammation, which impacts their asthma to a, to a um, higher degree. For other people, their inflammation isn't that large, but there is some degree of inflammation going on in anybody who has asthma. A big factor are these hyper-responsive or twitchy airways. So when they're exposed to certain triggers, which we'll talk a lot about, the airways will squeeze and tighten very rapidly, which is what produces a lot of the symptoms that go along with asthma. Most importantly, that twitchiness is reversible. Uh, so we know that when we give people medications that help bronchodilate, those airways can be opened up again. So it's not necessarily static and that they stay like that. Although if we don't adequately treat asthma and it, and it lasts throughout life, uh, it can lead to long-standing chronic changes and stiffened airways. In regards to the airflow limitation, I love this picture because it's not just the squeezing of the muscles. So if you look at the, the lower bronchioles of the airways, it's kind of like a tree turned upside down with, with branches that get smaller and smaller inside our lungs. And if you look at the, the um, middle part here, it's the lumen where air is supposed to flow both in and out. Well, with asthma, you have constriction of those muscles around that bronchiole, so it can make it smaller. And you also get swelling inside as well, uh, depicted on the right on your, on your picture there. And then lastly, individuals with asthma tend to have more mucus, and it's a different type of mucus. Uh, it's more of a sticky tar-like uh, substance. So if you imagine somebody with a narrowed airway because of squeezing of the muscles, with swelling on the inside, so you get squeezing on the outside, swelling on the inside, and then you fill that with mucus, it's going to make it really hard to breathe. Asthma is diagnosed clinically. There is no special test that diagnoses asthma. We have spirometry and pulmonary function tests that show us what lung function looks like, but we have to put that in the context of the clinical history. So when we diagnose asthma, it's really based upon what symptoms are, are occurring. So you have to have symptoms in order to diagnose asthma. It's often underdiagnosed, or people use terms like reactive airway disease, or they call it these other things, but we need to call it what it is so we can properly manage it. It is going to change over time. Uh, this is something I counsel families all the time. Your asthma is going to be very different in the autumn and the winter, as we'll talk about, and it often gets better as, as people get older. Uh, so our management should change all the time as well. We now have so many different treatment options available, and we'll talk about some of those because your students may have different types of inhalers that you're not used to seeing or different approaches to treating their symptoms that it's important to be all aware of. And this really is very individualized when it comes to asthma. It is not one size fits all. There are many types of asthma. Uh, so you can have intermittent asthma, meaning you have symptoms you know, infrequently, or you can have chronic asthma when you have more frequent symptoms, more severe symptoms that impact you on a more regular basis. There's different degrees of severity. You can have mild asthma, moderate asthma, severe asthma. And this is based upon frequency of symptoms, uh, level of therapy that's required to get things under control, uh, as well as lung function testing. 
and symptoms can be highly variable. So uh, it, it's important to kind of keep in mind that every student's different, and then each student can also change over time. So whatever that student, however you treated them last year, they may have a completely different treatment plan this year uh, in regards to their asthma, and that may change throughout the school year as well. And it can develop at any age. Uh, we often see it in, uh, in toddlers who go on to develop more persistent asthma, but it certainly can present later in childhood or even in adulthood for the first time as well. I get asked a lot about what causes X, Y, and Z. And just like most health conditions, there is no single cause. It's the same with asthma. Uh, there are multiple factors that contribute to who, which individual develop, develops asthma, including risk factors. We know there's a very strong genetic predisposition. So when you have parents with a history of asthma or other types of allergic conditions like eczema and allergic rhinitis, it's more likely that their children are going to develop asthma. Uh, obesity um, increases risk for developing asthma as well. Exposure to the environment. So early life exposures, especially uh, viral infections, exposure to small particulates and pollution. We know that people that live within you know, three or four football fields of a major highway have increased risk of, of experiencing wheezing and asthma over time. So just exposure to that pollution on a regular basis can influence the development of asthma. Same with uh, those who have allergies, exposure to passive tobacco smoke. There's uh, you know, lots of work looking at the microbiome, and we know that you know infants who are treated with frequent courses of antibiotics are are more likely to develop asthma. Not that antibiotics necessarily cause asthma. We don't know exactly what's going on there, but these are associations that have been identified. And then there's different types of immune cells involved in that inflammation that I mentioned before. Uh, for some people, these are called eosinophils. Others have neutrophils. And and on, on on my end, when I when I think through those patients with asthma, thinking through really the immunology and the and the pathology behind it can help me really find the best best treatment um, fit for that individual. All right, so symptoms are really important to recognize. Cough. Cough is the most frequent symptom associated with asthma, especially at night, um, particularly if it wakes children from sleep. So I always ask those questions. If they're sleeping through the night and not waking due to cough, that's a relatively good sign that their asthma is under good control, but it certainly can impact them during the day as well. One of the more sensitive signs, we call it post-tussive emesis. So if you're coughing so hard that you actually throw up, uh, including just mucus, that's a pretty good sign that that's probably asthma. So that's severe bronchoconstriction going on inside the airways, making you cough so hard to the point where you're actually triggering that vomiting reflex. You can't always hear wheezing, especially if you're not listening with a stethoscope. So I don't counsel families to wait for the wheezing. You certainly can have very severe asthma and not hear a wheeze. Um, and oftentimes when you hear wheezing, it's actually coming from the nose or the upper airway, not the lower airways, but it certainly can be present as well. Uh, people often state that they are out of breath or short of breath, or they feel like somebody's squeezing their chest. Uh, there used to be billboards that say, I feel like a fish out of water, I'm breathing through a straw, that sort of thing. And you can develop increased work of breathing. And this can lead to increased, um, uh, I'm sorry, respiratory distress. And if you have a student who's you know, really struggling to breathe and you see them sucking into the point where the muscles above their sternum or in their ribs are really retracting very hard, that's a late sign that you know, their asthma is very severe and they need to be treated immediately. And when we're trying to figure out if somebody has asthma or somebody with asthma, if their symptoms are due to asthma, I ask a simple question. Use your albuterol, which we'll talk about. Does that make you feel better? Because all of these symptoms can occur for other reasons. Uh, one of the more common ones we see in older children and adolescents is something called vocal cord dysfunction. And this can be very similar to asthma, often occurs in the same individual with asthma, and it's very acute. They say, I feel like I'm dying. And this occurs very suddenly. And the vocal cords, when they're supposed to, they're supposed to open when, when, you, when you inhale, they actually squeeze and tighten where you, you feel like you're dying. That one may, that may actually cause audible strider or wheezing that you can hear. So we need to tease some of these things out. So I always like to ask, and you're never going to fail. Um, if, if you think that it's asthma symptoms, use albuterol and see if it makes them feel better. So most importantly, and, and you're going to be so sick of me saying this, but I think it's important to, to really understand all of your students with asthma and children, they're all different. Uh, they're all different in regards to the severity, the frequency of symptoms, the response to therapy, the triggers that are occurring. It's going to change throughout the year. And I want you to get comfortable with really having that fluid approach to management and, and changing things that may be more intense in the fall and winter as opposed to in the spring and summer. When it comes to asthma management, it really depends on you know, how severe their asthma is or how chronic their asthma is. So we have intermittent asthma that I mentioned before and persistent. When somebody has infrequent symptoms, uh, we really focus just on uh, recognizing those symptoms when they occur, trying to avoid those triggers and then use as needed therapy. Uh, whereas if somebody has persistent symptoms, they often would benefit from using daily scheduled medications to treat that inflammation inside the lungs. 
The most commonly used would be things like inhaled corticosteroids, uh, but there are other approaches as well. We want to address their comorbid conditions. So if they have terrible environmental allergies and they have all this snot running down their throat from nasal congestion, we want to try to fix that because that's going to improve their asthma since the airway is connected from the top to the bottom. And then we want to, I, I, I'd spend a lot of time on a good environmental assessment. If you have asthma and you go home and inside your home, you're exposed to multiple chronic triggers such as you know, pollution, pet dander, tobacco smoke, uh, whatever it may be, we need to reduce that exposure to those triggers. Otherwise, we may never be able to get your asthma under control despite our best efforts and use of high potency medications. But that's not all. We want to make sure that anybody with asthma, especially parents of children and then children as they get older, we need to educate them and to help understand here, here's what's going on inside your body, your child's body. Here's why these medications are important. Here's what triggers are. Really focus on self-management skills. I see them in the office when I was running our complex asthma clinic. I would see the most severe asthmatics maybe every two months. So I'm seeing them six times a year for what, 30 minutes at a time, but the rest of the time they have to be out in the world recognizing and living with their asthma. And it's up to me to help them develop those skills so they can self-manage their own disease uh, because they're the ones who have to live with it and know how to treat it when they're at home or school or wherever they are. We wanna make sure that they have proper teaching in regards to proper inhaler technique and using spacers, which we'll talk about. And it's not just there. It's not just, okay, you have bad asthma or you have asthma, have a nice life. It's, I wanna come back and see you long-term follow, but every visit we're gonna you know, provide anticipatory guidance about the upcoming seasons that are going on, review your, your control to this point and really provide written treatment plans that they can share with all of you at school and talk about you know dynamic treatment options. So it, it really is a very comprehensive approach to helping people manage and understand their asthma. It's much more involved than just giving them an inhaler and saying, uh, use this whenever you get short of breath. This is a great um, graphic from the GINA guidelines. So there's the global uh, asthma initiative guidelines. Then we have our uh, NHLBI US asthma guidelines. I'll show you a screenshot of both of them uh, towards the end here. But I like this little circle because it really sets the stage for, okay, let's assess your asthma. Are we doing, how are we doing? Uh, how are your symptoms under good control? Are we addressing your comorbid conditions? What's your adherence like with your medications? Let's adjust therapy. Are you doing great? We can step things down. Are you not doing so well? Then we need to step things up and we need to add things or we need to address the environment or things like that. And then we need to review things at every visit. So this really is this cycle um, that never ends in regards to asthma management. And I hope that we get to a good place where most folks get used to this and it's more tune-ups along the way. Sometimes it's major adjustments at the beginning of initial diagnosis or after hospitalization. Uh, but you know, whenever I see folks in follow-up, it's usually more minor, minor tweaks over time. So what are our goals of therapy? Well, we want to make people feel better. Uh, we're never going to be able to completely eliminate symptoms because if that's the case, then you don't have asthma. Although I will state that there is a recent um, working group working group report that's going to come out talking about remission of asthma. Um, because there are some people that, you know, just their asthma gets better as they get older. Uh, but that's going to be a little bit controversial. But for most people, if you have asthma, you're going to have symptoms at some point. But our goal is to reduce the frequency and reduce the severity of those symptoms. Well-controlled asthma means using albuterol two times a week or less. So you're going to use your albuterol, um, and that's okay. Um, but that, that just means that we, we want to properly manage it. We want to keep people out of the emergency room and off uh, from needing oral corticosteroids because of exacerbations. We want people to you know, run around and be active and play sports. Please don't tell any child with asthma that they can't play sports or be active because of their asthma. That is not the case. In fact, exercise is one of the best things they can do for their lungs uh, to improve lung function and, and make them feel better overall. If they can't exercise because of their asthma, they need to talk to their doctor. We need to find a way to make sure that they can do that. Uh, so that's our goal. I think there's like, what, 30% of Olympians have asthma or something like that. So that's what we should be striving for. Um, and then we really want to also minimize any side effects of treatment as well. So we need to monitor that long term. All right, when we talk about sending students with or children with, with asthma to school, I like to think about the different roles and responsibilities. And, and there's different categories. So what are the responsibilities of the family? Well, they really need to inform the school that their child has asthma. You need to be aware of which students have asthma. So that's up to them to make sure that they inform you. We need, they need to make sure that they send all of their medications at the start of the school year with up-to-date prescriptions. August is my busiest month of the year because of all the school forms and treatment plans and refills. I love it. It gets to be a bit much, but we have processes in place to help all of our families make sure they, they get what they need. Um, the written treatment plan really should be updated every year because asthma can change, as you've heard me say 16 times already. And then if your child 
uh, or if that student isn't feeling well, the school really should be informed. So um, if they're starting to use their albuterol more, if they're fighting a cold, uh, but they're well enough to go to school, please let the school nurse know or let their teacher know that, oh, okay, we have everything under control. They may need to use their albuterol during the day, or they may, you may actually request that they use it during the day on a scheduled basis to help maintain, um, you know, let them stay in school. What are the responsibilities of the school? Well, you need to, um, you know, be, be able to listen to that family, obviously, and uh, acknowledge that which students have asthma. Uh, how you keep track of that is up to you. Every school is going to be very different. Store all the medications in a very safe and accessible location. We don't want to have to, you know, have them go to a different building to get their albuterol or anything like that. We want that accessible for when they need to use it. Monitor symptoms for increase or monitor students for increased symptoms. Uh, treat them when when they need to be treated within the school setting, which we'll spend more time talking about. And then if they're not doing well in school, please let the family know. And say, you know, so-and-so um, was complaining of chest tightness today or they were coughing. We gave them albuterol so that they can continue the treatment at home. Because we all know that when we rely on our children uh, to communicate with us about how their school day went, they're not always very forthcoming with that sort of information. And really, what's the responsibility of the student? Well, it depends on the age. But ultimately, they need to let somebody know. Let an adult know if you're not feeling well, because we can do something about it. So let's talk about triggers for a moment. So triggers can occur both on a chronic basis or on an acute basis. And you can have a child with asthma who's either well-controlled or not well-controlled, and they're exposed to one of these triggers, and it can increase their symptoms by increasing um, the bronchoconstriction and the spasm inside the airways, as well as increasing their inflammation. And this can cause immediate onset symptoms upon exposure, even severe symptoms, or it can be more chronic symptoms if they're exposed to triggers on a more regular basis. And the school setting is loaded with potential triggers. Not every child with asthma has the exact same triggers. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a blanket approach of if you have asthma, you, the, the, all of these things are going to trigger your symptoms. So we really need to figure out who has what triggers. And on the written asthma treatment plan, it often includes, these are my child's triggers. Exercise is not a trigger for everybody with asthma, but for those that do have exercise as a trigger, we wanna know that and we wanna come up with a plan to help them use their albuterol 15 minutes prior to gym or recess or any planned physical activity. Viral infections are a very common trigger. And the typical story is they get sick with, a, with an upper respiratory infection or a cold. And within 24 to 48 hours, they develop a more severe persistent cough and or wheeze and symptoms just progress from there. So that's a very common trigger, especially in autumn and fall. I'm sorry, autumn and winter. Weather can be a trigger. I don't know where all of you are located, but here in the Midwest, we're, I mean, it's gonna be 97 degrees tomorrow. Uh, so heat and humidity can be a, a major trigger as can extremes of cold. And the reason why cold air is a trigger is because cold air lacks humidity and it's very dry. And that can cause irritation and bronchospasm. I'm sure all of you have been exposed to extremes of cold. And if you have, it can burn when you actually try to breathe. Well, for people with asthma, that can trigger their symptoms. But changes in weather can do it as well. If there are cold fronts moving through or thunderstorms uh, or severe weather, that can be a trigger for asthma. We all have to be aware now of air quality, especially with the Canadian wildfires and other wildfires, depending upon where you live, that introduces small particulates into the air. Uh, ozone action days occur on very hot, humid days with very little wind, uh, and that can be a trigger for asthma as well. And then for those who have also have allergies, uh, they can be exposed to cockroaches inside the school or, or mouse infestations. Other students who have pets, especially cats and dogs, the dander from their pets, they carry on their clothes to the school. And if you're sitting next to somebody who has a cat or a dog, even if you don't have that pet in your home, that dander can actually trigger asthma symptoms. They found pet dander in movie theaters, on public transportation, on the International Space Station, despite not having animals there. So it is everywhere in our environment. Food allergies can provoke asthma uh, symptoms for those who have asthma, but typically those are going to be more things like hives and swelling and vomiting and anaphylaxis. Uh, despite your best intentions to, to keep everything clean, the cleaning supplies themselves may actually they trigger asthma symptoms. So any aerosol uh, that has a scent to it, even if it's you know a cleaning product, that can get inside the small airways and trigger bronchospasm. So uh, if you can smell these smells uh, from the detergents or from the cleaning products they're using, especially ammonia, that can be a trigger. And we may want to um, protect that student with asthma from going into that area until the smell is gone. Same thing if you're fumigating, we want to make sure you let everybody aware. And then emotions can trigger asthma as well. Uh, I have many patients that tell me if they if they get tickled or laugh too hard, that actually triggers them to cough and, and and struggle to breathe or if they get very upset in a negative way. And then I have a plea for all of you. Are you ready? Here's my plea. Please, essential oils, they are not only not essential, but essential oils can absolutely be a trigger for people with asthma and allergies. 
any scented product, whether it's all natural or it smells good to people, if you aerosolize it and gets in the air, it can be really irritating for those with sensitive noses or sensitive lungs. And I've met a lot of families over the years and even talked to teachers where they're, they're using essential oil diffusers in the classroom for good purposes. They have good intentions of trying to provide relaxation to students and, and make things um, you know, much more calm in that environment. But that can absolutely be a trigger for those with asthma. Uh, so please keep that in mind if you're using those in the classroom setting. All right, what about after school? Well, if they're going to athletic events uh, or practice for sports, again, it goes back to exercise. If they're you know, waiting for the bus stop or they're gonna be outside those extremes of weather uh, that I mentioned before. And then we also be, need to be aware more of like the outdoor allergens. There's a consistent pattern. It's gonna change based upon when it starts and how long it lasts by where you live. But typically trees will pollinate in the spring. That can cause significant um, asthma symptoms. Grasses and weeds are in the summer. Right now is ragweed season. Uh, it's typically mid-August until the first frost of the year. And then we can see mold spores outdoors during damp, rainy weather throughout spring, summer, and fall. And then if, if they're um, waiting you know, uh, for the school bus or walking through people that are smoking cigarettes or other forms of, of tobacco, that can be a trigger as well. So as you see, you know, I spent a few minutes here talking about all of the multiple different triggers, and they can vary based upon students, uh, and they can impact a lot of students that have asthma uh, for various reasons. We have to talk about the autumn asthma spike. So every single year uh, in mid, mid to late September, approximately 22 days after the start of the school year, and this has been documented on multiple continents, we see a spike in asthma exacerbations that drives kids to the emergency room, hospitalizations, things like that. And there's a combination of factors. 22 days happens to be a pretty good incubation for respiratory virus, uh, pretty good incubation period for respiratory viruses. So as kids go back to school, after about three weeks, they're all sick. That's when the first respiratory virus starts to circulate among everybody. And as I mentioned, that's a major trigger for asthma exacerbations. This is also a time when many locations experience weather changes or extremes of weather. And then for those who also have pollen allergies to ragweed or mold allergies, that tends to spike in the autumn as well. So September, October is always a big spike in asthma exacerbations. And it's important to be aware of that. It's important that you know which students have asthma. If they're starting to have increased symptoms, pay very close close attention to them, especially during this time of the year. We see, we see a similar spike in the spring as well, also from respiratory viruses, also from the tree pollen, also from the extremes of weather based upon where you live. All right, let's move on to medications and treatment. So we have two basic types of medications for asthma. Most of these medications are gonna be given through an inhaler. Why? Because we want the medicine to go to the lungs and act right where the symptoms are occurring. There's relievers. Relievers work very fast. They treat the symptoms and people should always have them available or have access to them. Then we have controllers. So controllers are more for those with more persistent asthma, more severe asthma. We wanna give these on a more scheduled basis. That's gonna address the inflammation inside the lungs. They don't provide immediate relief but that's changed. So now we have smart therapy, which I'm gonna talk about. There are two specific types of controllers that can be used on demand that can also bronchodilate while they treat the inflammation. You're going to see more and more students that have this as part of their treatment plan. And it's important to be aware of this and, and increase your comfort with it. Inhalers vary. I love this. This is from the Allergen Asthma Network. Uh, so there's different types of inhalers. So we have meter dose inhalers. The medicine, this is a liquid. You, you express it by some pumps. It turns into a mist. You breathe it in the lungs. We have dry powdered inhalers where the medicine, this is a powder and you have to actually you know, activate it uh, by clicking it or something like that. And then you have to breathe it in and hold it, uh, hold it in your lungs to make sure it settles there. There are breath actuated inhalers where you put it in your mouth and it does nothing until you actually breathe in really fast. All of these deliver medication very differently. Um, all of these require a very different technique. So if you're not familiar with the technique of an inhaler that you know, your student gives to you, there's great resources on the Allergen Asthma Network website, uh, or you can ask that student or ask that, that student's parents to really walk you through it to make sure you know how to use it. Uh, and these are changing all the time. So when somebody has acute asthma symptoms, what do we want to do? Well, we want to open up the airways. A major part of those acute symptoms is constriction of the airways. And we can do that through four different approaches. Uh, the most common one that you're familiar with is a short acting bronchodilator. This is something like albuterol. So albuterol hits those receptors inside the lungs uh, that are causing the constriction and it helps them relax. So you see this effect within minutes, generally within 15 minutes, but the effect wears off after, after three to four hours. So they need to be repeated. That does not treat the inflammation though. So there's also inflammation and swelling going on inside the lungs, but we wanna open them up. The most common form again, albuterol. Now we have long acting bronchodilators. So as I mentioned before, these combination medications, they have both an inhaled corticosteroid and a long acting bronchodilator. They work very quickly, similar to albuterol, but they last for 12 hours. They can be used acutely if somebody's having asthma symptoms or they may be also be prescribed as a controller therapy. 
There are medications that work on other receptors called cholinergic receptors. Uh, these are medications like ipratropium, um, typically delivered through a nebulizer. So you may have some students that you know, respond better to that as opposed to albuterol. And then we have other medications that uh, impact muscarinic receptors. So there's lots of different receptors inside the lower respiratory tract that can help bronchodilate. So you may see variations of these medications in some of your students. Like I said, at the onset of this webinar, things are changing. Our understanding of asthma continues to grow uh, year by year. Treatment options continue to evolve. Uh, and you know we need to sort of move past some outdated um, thoughts in regards to asthma and uh, stay up to date with current evidence-based practice. Okay, I always like to talk about albuterol because there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding this. Please don't refer to albuterol as an emergency inhaler. It is an, a reliever. If you have asthma, you will have symptoms. If you have symptoms, you will need to bronchodilate. If you need to bronchodilate, you're gonna need your, your albuterol. If we tell people or if we educate parents that this is an emergency inhaler, that sends them a very negative message. And that message means one, well, I should only use this in the case of an emergency. So they wait for days and days and days to treat when we don't wanna do that. The sooner you treat, the better it works. The other message it sends is if I use my albuterol, I have to go to the emergency room. We don't wanna do that. We want self-management skills. We want people to understand this is your reliever. You're going to need to use this. I want you to feel free to use this. It's going to make you feel better. If you find that you're using this on a regular basis or more frequently, please talk to your doctor because we can adjust your therapy and hopefully reduce that use. So hopefully that will resonate with you, but it is not an emergency inhaler. It is a normal standard expected part of asthma management. So when should we give albuterol? It's really easy. If you have a student with asthma and they report an increase in symptoms, treat them with albuterol. Um, that's the, the best way to go about this. You don't need to have a, a peak flow monitor. You don't need to have a pulse ox reading. You don't need to have wheezing on exam or, or to hear wheezing. If they tell you that they're having chest tightness or they're coughing, give them albuterol. It's a very safe medication to use. We don't want to withhold it. You're not going to hurt them if you give it when it's not necessary. And we'll talk about that in a second. Some of your students may have peak flow monitors. That's nice, but that's very effort dependent. So we don't want, I don't really care what the number says. If you tell me you don't feel well, I'm treating you. Same thing with the pulse ox reading. We're not going to see a, a drop in the pulse ox inventory reading until it's too late, until, you know, asthma has progressed to the point where it's actually, um, you know, um, restricting the airflow and, and causing more systemic issues. So we don't want need to wait for these things. So how many puffs of albuterol? I put this up here. Look, these are guidelines, the top one from the United States from, oh my gosh, what, 16 years ago? And then um, these were updated in the GINA guidelines several years ago as well. So from 16 years ago, two to six puffs of albuterol every three to four hours at home use. It's very safe to give. We want to bronchodilate. The global um, strategy for asthma management, four to 10 puffs every 20 minutes for an hour. How many of you just gasped when I said that? Why? Because it's very safe. Why? Because if they're not breathing well, we want to bronchodilate and improve airflow. It's very safe to do this. This is guideline-based management. The two puffs every four hours, if you need more puffs or if you need it more frequently, you have to go to the ER. That is so outdated. Nobody should be prescribed that anymore. All of our patients are, are, are advised at least four to six puffs every three to four hours. And we give them that leeway to really bronchodilate. If they're having, you know, if they're, if they think they're managing their asthma, okay, but they wake up in the morning and they're coughing more than usual, go ahead and use more puffs. Use it, you know, 20 minutes later. Let's see how you feel. Um, so it's very safe to approach it that way. What about inhalers versus nebulizers? So I hear this question all the time. There are studies looking at this. So I put the Cochrane review. So they looked at, um, you know, over 2000 children and adults in almost 40 clinical trials and having mild to moderate exacerbations. And what they found is that using the inhaler with proper technique um, is equivalent to delivering the medication through a nebulizer and you get more side effects than the nebulizer. Now here's the difference. You often need to give at least four puffs through the meter dose inhaler to be equivalent to one dose of the nebulizer. And I know everybody out there listening is gonna say, well, the nebulizer seems to work better. Well, yes, it does seem to work better, but if you try the other approach, it's faster, it has less side effects, and it, it's gonna actually be equivalent if not better. Um, a lot of the times nebulizers are used incorrectly and you're just you know, spreading medicine into the environment and not actually into the lungs. Uh, other times, especially for younger children, if they have a lot of nasal congestion, sometimes the humidified air can help break that up, but that's what nasal saline sprays do. Um, so we really want to empower people. I've had families that tell me they had to leave the soccer game because they had to drive all the way home and give their child the nebulizer treatment. No, have the inhaler, have the spacer and use it when you, see, when you need it. Speaking of spacers, so every meter dose inhaler, not dry powdered inhaler, a meter dose inhaler, this is liquid inside there. 
And when you, it, when you compress it, it turns it into a mist, but it takes about four inches for that mist to turn into a fine enough particle so you can breathe it into lungs. So what happens is if you just put that meter dose inhaler in your mouth, you can have the best coordinated technique in the world. It's just not enough space. Most of the medicine stays as a liquid and it sits on the tongue and gets swallowed and it goes to the stomach, not to the lungs. And there's great studies where they actually put little radio labels on this and you see where the medicine goes. So a space or attachment, and there's all kinds of different spaces that you can use, just adds that distance to allow the medicine to turn into a mist. Then you can take a slow, deep inhalation. It's already a mist by the time it hits your lips, goes inside the lungs where it needs to go. And it's much more effective that way. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how, how good your technique is. The best argument I've, I've ever you know, thought of in regards to why we need to use the spacer, there's a condition called eosinophilic esophagitis, which causes inflammation in the esophagus. The way one of the treatment mechanisms is you take an asthma inhaler, like an inhaled steroid, like fluticasone, and you have them do that without a spacer. Why? Because they're going to swallow it and it's going to treat the esophagus. So if that's not the best argument why we need to use a spacer for asthma, I don't know what is. Albuterol is very safe. There are so many misconceptions about it could be dangerous. There are common side effects. So it also hits receptors in the, in the uh, nervous system and in the heart, which can increase the heart rate slightly, not to a dangerous degree, and it can cause some jitteriness. So people can feel those side effects and some are a little more sensitive than others, but it doesn't you know, cause severe tachycardia uh, or changes the blood pressure or things like that that's gonna you know, be worrisome. All of the serious adverse effects are associated with continuous nebulizer use in the, in the ICU or emergency setting. That's where we see those bad side effects. So we don't want to withhold treatment of albuterol due to un, um, you know, unnecessary concerns about side effects that aren't really going to occur. Why do we want to treat? Because you're going to make them feel better. And I learned this in medical school, breathing is good. So if people are struggling to breathe, we want to help them breathe. Um, and it can be more dose effects. So again, I showed you the, the um, recommendations from the world guidelines about how many puffs to give. Please consider this and don't withhold giving out butyrol because you think it's going to cause major side effects. Some of the things I've heard over the years about what people have been told in school to treat their acute asthma, take a drink of water. That's not going to make you feel better. Going outside, well, that actually might make you feel worse depending upon what's going on with the weather uh, or you know, your pollen allergies and things like that. Just one puff of albuterol, that's not going to do anything. If you're going to do it, give at least two. Don't hesitate to give up to four to six. And yes, I know you may be stuck based upon what the written treatment plan states or what's prescribed, but that's why I'm also working with pediatricians and other you know, asthma specialists to help get them to write down the right things so that you can give it in the school setting. Um, lying down, that's not going to make you feel better or focusing on your breathing. And I've had people actually have essential oils rubbed on their skin to treat their asthma. That's a terrible idea. Um, so please, you know, give them the medication that they were sent to school with, uh, to make them feel better. Uh, other people have said, well, what about, should we just have them drink some coffee or, or, or get some caffeine? So yeah, caffeine is a bronchodilator. Do you know how much caffeine you would have to ingest, uh, in order to bronchodilate? way more than you're going to want to feel. So the side effects associated with the significant amount of caffeine you would need to drink to actually improve asthma symptoms, um, it's not worth it. So it's not an effective treatment uh, for, for, um, for asthma. There's also some evidence that shows that cannabis can actually serve as a bronchodilator. Uh, but again, we don't want to be using that, <laughs> especially in the school setting. All right, smart therapy. So single maintenance and reliever therapy. It's one inhaler, it's your controller and your reliever, or it can just be your, your reliever. You, I've talked about this already, but let's get into the weeds a little bit. You can use this, you can increase the use when you're sick. There's two medications. We always try to refrain from brand names, but I think it's important to use these for this case because these are the only two that you can use for this. Simbicort and Dulera. Why are these the only two? Because the long-acting albuterol, long-acting beta agonist they have is called Formoterol. There's, there's a couple of other combination medications that have long acting albuterols, but they don't have the same onset of action as formoterol does. Formoterol acts like albuterol. It works very, very quickly, but it lasts for up to 12 hours. Uh, so that's why these are the specific ones that we can use for this type of therapy. And these are now guideline based. So for anybody who's interested, I encourage you, please go check out the global asthma guidelines. The last time that the US guidelines were updated was in 2020. So now it's three years of having smart therapy being recommended. And this is what it looks like. I'm not going to read the whole slide for you, but there's recommendations for younger children as well as older children, both to use those uh, combination inhalers either as a controller and then increase use when you start to have symptoms or just use it as your reliever. Uh, so there are some of your students that they may not actually be sent to school with albuterol. They may be sent to school with Simbicort or Dulera, and that's the reliever medication that you want to administer to them according to their treatment plan. So things are changing in a very good way. And this works great. 
And you're gonna say, what about overuse? Well, what happens is if you have somebody with asthma, the typical story is I feel fine most of the time. I'm exposed to my trigger four, five, six times throughout the year. If you start puffing away on one of these combination inhalers and you only use it for seven days, you know, um, every other month, that's great. You're actually reducing your overall use of medication throughout the year. You're reducing the use of unnecessary medication and it's gonna work really well uh, to prevent exacerbation. So just want you to be aware of that. Uh, some of your students are hopefully already on this type of therapy because it works really well. All right, I'm sure you're all familiar with asthma action plans. This is written communication from a family and their and the student's doctor to you telling you this is what their asthma is like, their triggers, their severity in the green zone, all systems go. This is what they do on a regular basis, regardless of how they feel. Probably won't have to do anything inside the school setting. The red zone should be pretty easy. They need to be treated immediately. Uh, they're uh, at the onset of a severe exacerbation and you should be thinking about notifying the parents and uh, calling EMS. The yellow zone. So the yellow zone is where we want to focus our effort. And this is really individualized. So some people may be told to start their medication sooner. Some people may be told to give six puffs of albuterol. Some people may be, called, may be told to use that SMART therapy that I just talked about. Um, but it's important that every student has this action plan that's up to date because that's what you really go to when they present to you and they say, I'm really having a hard time breathing today or I'm having more cough or my chest feels tight and stuff like that. So we really want to recognize when they're losing control and do something about it as soon as possible. In the green zone, all systems clear, red zone, too late, seek care, yellow zone, we can treat them and hopefully keep them in the school setting and make them feel better. So it's a fine balance at times. And for some, some of your students are going to require treatment more frequently than others, uh, but it's important to be aware of uh, what their management plan entails and be comfortable with it. So a lot of people ask me, what if I give albuterol it's not necessary? Well, a false start may actually lead to treatment when they don't need it, but the risk of a late start means that their symptoms are going to progress and they may end up in the emergency room. You, it's much better to be early. You're not going to hurt them by giving albuterol if they don't actually need it. Um, you may actually contribute to, to their worsening asthma exacerbation if you don't treat them when they actually needed it. Um, so it's much, much better to use it. If you're not sure, use it early rather than wait. Now, a lot of um, schools are opting to use stock albuterol. So this is legislation that was passed in 17 states, and then there's guidelines in two others. And what this allows for is this allows for schools to actually obtain a prescription or an order uh, from any physician um, and to obtain um, inhalers for the school. And you can put this in your school. Uh, this also in involves training of school personnel. This also involves having sort of the, the documentation of when to treat and how to treat and things like that. And the, what the legislation allows for is you can treat any student in your school, whether they have asthma or don't have asthma, or you're not sure if they have asthma with this medication that you've now procured to have them. Uh, this is very similar to the stock epinephrine legislation, which is in almost every state now, I think every state. Um, so this is, this is great because albuterol is very safe. Albuterol, uh, if, if you have a student that doesn't have their own inhaler, uh, I know you all have students in your school that have asthma that don't have their medication on site. You can obtain it. You can treat them with this. And there's a lot of nuance that goes into this. There's a lot of great information on the allergy and asthma network, as well as other places. But I encourage all of you, if you live in one of these states, look into this, get albuterol. Um, I'll put a plug in, uh, Linda mentioned I'm the host of the podcast for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. We had two recent episodes just on stock, stock epinephrine and stock albuterol this summer. You can search for it. Uh, we had two experts that really walked through what this entails, lots of details there. So I encourage you to look into this. Now, what does this mean for families that live in these states? Don't trust this. This is going to be, you know, it's very inconsistent in regards to which states allow it, which schools actually have it. Uh, so we want to encourage all of those families to send their medication with their student to school. Uh, but this is a wonderful backup plan. Um, what about self-carry? Well, uh, as of, oh my gosh, almost 10 years, every state allows for students to self-carry their own inhalers. So by law, they're allowed to carry their own inhalers, but it's important for you to also know which one of those, which of those students actually have their inhaler on, on them um, and, you know, are allowed to treat themselves. This is, you know, there's no easy answer for this. There's no age cutoff. Sometimes there are nine-year-olds that are, are, are able to recognize their symptoms and use proper technique. I have many patients that are 16 and they're unable to do this. There are a lot of adults that are unable to do this. So there's no magic age. For me personally, I talk to the families about this when they express interest. I need that, that child to really demonstrate, here's when I would use my inhaler. Here's what my body feels like. And they need to show me. 
They need to show me that they have the right technique um, and that they know what they're doing. So the benefit would be immediate access. It's more, it's really self-management to the nth degree and you can treat quickly. The cons are um, they may use their inhaler and not let the school know uh, or let their parents know. Uh, obviously they can lose their inhaler uh, and not have it when it's necessary for treatment, or they may be, you know, abusing it in appropriate use. In my experience, that's usually not the case, but um, Every state allows for self-carry and it's up to you to work with families and figure out what work, works best for your school and, and your school building and school district. So as we wrap up here, we know that there are students in your school and in, in your classroom that have asthma. Symptoms are variable. They can occur suddenly, but they may be more chronic and really just you know communication. It's all about communication and preparation. Uh, and I truly hope that uh, I offered some uh, new concepts and there's a bit of a paradigm shift in some of this to increase your comfort level with some new approaches to asthma. Uh, and hopefully we can keep everybody safe this school year. And with that, Linda, I think we have time for questions. Is that correct? We, we have about 15 minutes. So thank you, Dr. Dave. Really wonderful presentation was packed with really great information for everyone. I really do appreciate it. Um, and, and, you know, I, Long time ago, I was a mom of a kid with asthma and allergies, so I relied on school nurses knowing how to manage that asthma, and it was just so important. So really appreciate you coming here to share your information today. Um, so I, I want to just um, do some Q&A, and then we'll talk about the upcoming web webinars that we'll be having uh, later in September. But first, um, I'm going to go through like the questions that came in, and I hope I can read them. <laughs> so. Um, Let's see. Uh, well, here's an easy one for you. Can cannabis be an asthma trigger for children? Oh, yes. Thank you. So any form of, of smoke. Uh, so whether it's, you know, from a pipe, uh, from, from cannabis, marijuana, uh, vaping. So vaping is not safe. Um, anything that releases aerosols into the air absolutely can be a trigger. So uh, forgive me for not mentioning that specifically, but thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, and how about anxiety? Can anxiety be a trigger for asthma? It doesn't cause inflammation, but can it be a trigger? Yes, yeah, so this gets a little tricky. So it, it does absolutely, as, as with other emotional stressors, that can be a trigger for asthma. But then this is on my end to try to separate out of like, okay, what's actually anxiety, symptoms due to anxiety, not asthma, because they can often feel similar. And those are some of the most satisfying, um, you know, families that I help. Uh, those are also some of the most challenging ones. So we have different techniques and ways to do that. Um, you know, let me just say that there's a reason why we have psychologists on our staff. Uh, they're very helpful, uh, especially when we get into this overlap. Um, so from a school nurse perspective, when, when is it time to call 911 for a child with asthma or a child with um, reactive airway disease? So um, it, it's really easy uh, if they're if you treat them uh, according to their treatment plan and their symptoms do not improve because um, you're kind of stuck, right? Um, that's not your job. It's not your job to be the, the emergency room and manage their asthma. If but I want you to um, hopefully allow a reasonable period of time for their symptoms to improve. I mentioned it can take ten to fifteen minutes to see some benefit. So if it's more you know mild to moderate symptoms and you give some albuterol and you just let them kind of hang out and relax. Uh, in the office and they start to slowly improve, that's a great sign. Obviously, if they come in with severe symptoms, you're going to start treatment right away uh, and then, you know, notify 911. But there's no easy answer here other than if you treat them and their symptoms do not improve. Great. Thank you very much. I saw a couple of questions come up about how to obtain that inhaler chart. That's free on our website. Just go to our, our online store and you can just register or whatever it takes and you just get a free digital download for that inhaler chart. Um, and it's going to be updated again in a couple of months because there's another new inhaler coming on the market that's a combination inhaler. So, um, how many versions do you think we've seen since you started that? I, I maybe uh, a dozen. It, it's it's always hot off the press. That's all I can tell you. We can't keep up. Yeah. So, um, so you talked about the in, diffusers for essential oils. What about those bottles of oil that have reeds in them? Is that also not recommended or, or how do you approach those two? If you can smell it, it could be potentially a trigger. Um, so it's it's really that scent is so that 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 tells you it's been aerosolized. Um, and those are all potential triggers. I'm not saying it's going to trigger, but um, those are some of the hidden ones. And people use them because, you know, they have good intent, as I mentioned, um, and they think they may be beneficial. But I just want people to be aware they, they actually may be harmful for that student with asthma. Uh, what to do while waiting for a parent to bring an, an inhaler to school when the child is symptomatic? 
Oh, well, so that's a, so one, um, if you have stock albuterol, that's ideal. If you don't, uh, you can always try to help them focus on, on slowing their breathing and just relaxing as much as they can. Otherwise your hands are kind of tied, uh, but that's also a learning opportunity. So if that ever occurs, I mean, not in the moment necessarily, but that child absolutely needs to have their own inhaler at school. Uh, so take advantage of that opportunity to say, listen, uh, thank you for bringing it. Uh, we need to have this, you know, talk to your doctor. We need to have their own inhaler here so that we can treat them and not wait for you to have to come in. Absolutely. Um, another thing I just want to recommend and we'll, uh, we'll or, or mention, and we'll include this in the follow-up emails, the American Lung Association just released a new course on SOC albuterol implementation. Um, because that's such a, you know, a lot of difficulty in getting it actually implemented in school districts. So I just want to share that with that. Yeah, I just got a notification about it today. That's great. Um, let's see if I can find another question to ask you. So can you describe, the, explain the difference between asthma and reactive airway disease? Yes, reactive airway disease is a mispronunciation of the word asthma. <laughs> There, it's it's a made up it's a made up term to be totally honest with you and there's great review articles on this and uh, yeah it you know but we don't want to use that term uh, because it's confusing and I know a lot of folks are afraid to use the big bad a word but when you when you finally diagnose asthma we can do something about it when you're having these symptoms we can treat it uh, whereas with reactive airway disease a lot of times that sends the message of, oh they're just reacting again and nothing I can do no that's not it at all. Uh, so yeah, believe me, I, I do a lot of education for primary care pediatricians as well. I always make it a point uh, to say that reactive airway disease is not an actual diagnosis. Thank you for that. Um, should a nurse give an inhaler based on symptoms alone, um, like tightness in the chest, or should the nurse assess the student first, like listen to breath sounds and things like that? Well, I think it's always important to listen for, for um, breath sounds, but this can be variable and this can be very tricky. Uh, the absence of wheezing can sometimes actually be a really bad sign uh, because you're, the, bron the airflow is so um, obstructed that you're not going to even hear that wheezing. So as I mentioned before, if somebody's complaining of symptoms, treat them. You're not going to hurt them uh, and you don't want to withhold treatment um, you know, because of what, whatever reason. But yeah, I, I think an assessment is an important part of that. And really, I mean, if in the two minutes it takes you to do a good lung exam, I, that's fine as well, but that's not going to change anything in my mind. Although I would say um, it's actually a pre and post. So um, listening to the lungs at, at, uh, before they get their albuterol right afterwards, and then waiting 15 minutes and listening again, if you hear a dramatic improvement, that that's a very good sign that the medication is helping them. Um, can, I know you mentioned this during your presentation, but since we got a question, I'll ask it again. Can you talk about the peak flow meter and how it's kind of gone out of favor now um, and not used as much? Yeah, it, it, it's very effort dependent. Um, so people can blow the number, whatever number they want to blow, um, and it can change over time. And there's a lot of technique involved with it. So it's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, I would certainly would not um, depend entirely on that. Uh, either saying, oh my gosh, your number is terrible, but they, they look completely fine to you. Uh, or, you know, because sometimes you can manipulate that for certain reasons as well, for uh, positive reinforcement and getting out of class. Um, <laughs> or, um, you know, if, if the number looks good, but they're complaining of symptoms, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to withhold treatment. So it's certainly not the end all be all. Um, but yeah, it's, it, you know, at our institution, boy, I, I, we haven't used them for over 10, 15 years. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, so does it matter if um, a, a little kid who might be out of shape is short is winded after exercise in terms of whether or not you give out butyrol? Yeah. All right. So this is, tr this, I love that question. It's tricky, right? So anybody, including uh, the most conditioned folks in the, the world are going to reach a point during physical exertion where they get breathless. Um, that's a normal part of exertion, especially if somebody is deconditioned uh, or if they have obesity and things like that. That's different than asthma. Um, that is sort of shortness of breath. You have to catch your breath. That should improve after a couple of minutes of rest. Um, so that's one clue. Asthma um, often will not occur immediately when you start to exercise. It can take a period of time before you're actually exercising to trigger the bronchoconstriction. And that's not going to get better just with rest alone. So that's another indicator as well. Okay. Um, I just saw a question come in about cough variant asthma. Um, so can you talk a little bit about management of cough variant asthma in school? 
It's really the same. It's just the predominant symptom is cough. But I would also argue that that's the predominant symptom for most children with asthma. Um, yeah, it's an interesting sort of term. And we know there's there's all these different sort of subtypes of asthma uh, that, you know, based upon the immunology that's going on inside the lungs or the symptoms that are there, even response to therapy. Uh, there's a lot of folks that just, they don't, they don't get better without buterol. So we have to treat them with the anticholinergics. Um, there's no easy way to figure that out other than trial and error and, and, and teasing. But that's, cough and asthma is just one of those nuances of a different type of asthma. Great. Um, I see a question coming in about smart therapy. We have a really good article on our website about smart therapy and the easiest way to find it, we can put it in that follow-up email, is just Google smart therapy asthma and we're the first listing after the ads that come up and it, you can get to the article that way. Um, so just wanted to tell you that. And then I'm going to read a little bit of a long thing about when treating a student in the yellow zone and the order say two puffs every four hours, if the student initially gets relief from those two puffs, but then comes back in later in the day, do you still go ahead and treat or do you start to think they're in the red zone and take other kind of action? That's something you can answer easily, Dave, or, or yeah, no, I would say definitely treat. I, I would not withhold treatment. Um, you know, there there's a, a certain level of common sense here. And I know that there are, you know, restrictions based upon what's ordered and prescribed and stuff like that. But, you know, we also want to help that student in front of us and nothing bad's going to happen by doing that. Uh, but that's also, that to me is an indication that they have an ineffective yellow zone treatment plan. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, four to six puffs may have prevented that, you know, them coming back again. Um, but that's also what asthma does. The medication just wears off after a couple of hours. So they're going to need to be retreated re again. Okay. Um, and then somebody else asked about asthma action plan. Um, we have a whole page on our website about a whole bunch of different asthma action plans, including ones in multiple languages, an action plan for smart therapy. And so we, we have that already in the follow-up email that you'll get in a few days. So I just wanted to let you know, um, just look for that email. So I don't know if we have any other questions. Let me see here. They came in, a lot came in after you started answering them. So uh, yeah. this, I hope everybody um, gets a sense. I, I really am thankful for being here and I enjoy this. I love, love, love working with uh, school personnel, school nurses. I learned so much from all of you uh, and I want to do everything I possibly can to, to make your lives easier as well. Uh, but I've also learned that a lot of times your hands are kind of tied when it comes to this, which is really unfortunate. So Anything we can do to support each other. Um, yeah, that's that's all we can do. Yeah, thank you. Um, so can you talk about the difference between Zopinex and Albuterol? Um, you know, I, I know that there's some, sometimes it's prescribed and should there be stock Zopinex for kids who might need it? <laughs> Yeah, so Zopinex is the um, an antimer of albuterol, so it's like the mirror image of it, and it still works on those receptors, but it's allegedly has less side effects, so less jitteriness, but it also has a significantly higher cost. So from a stock standpoint, don't waste your money. Um, from a reality standpoint, boy, this was all the rage like 10 years ago, um, and then it just fell out of favor because it doesn't really have that much of a difference uh, in regards to reducing side effects. I suppose if you have somebody with a, a true cardiac abnormality, and we, we definitely want to make sure there's absolutely zero impact on that, that would be one, one reason to consider that. But there's other ways to control their symptoms as well. So yeah, as a general rule, uh, it's not worth the cost. Okay, great. So somebody asked, is it necessary for a doctor to indicate that a student may is allowed to self-carry their inhaler? Um, my guess is that some of it might vary by state law, but if you have any insight into that, please, Dr. Davies, I'd like welcome it. Yeah, it's, you know, we all have the forms and oh boy, if any of you can create a universal medication administration form for schools across the United States, please do so and implement that because, oh my gosh, they're all different. Um, so there is a provision, parents can check it off um, or physicians can check it off. But, um, but you know, if it's on that form, um, yeah, I guess you don't know who actually checked it off. <laughs> um, okay. So somebody asked if I am suspecting an asthma attack and do not have rescue medication, is purse lip breathing still standard as a way to control breathing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and the idea is just um, slow, deep inhalations, exhalations, just calm everything down. Um, yeah, that's, if, if you have nothing else, then yeah, that's, that's do that. Uh, it's just not going to be extremely effective, unfortunately. Okay. 
Well, you know what? It's it's 4.58. I'll see if I have one more quick question for you and then we'll go. But somebody asked if this, uh, several people asked if this is recording. Yes, I heard it say this, the recording has started. So we will have this recorded. It'll be on our homepage probably in a couple of days and then we'll send a link to you in the follow-up email as well. Um, let me see. Is there a youngest age that you can be diagnosed with asthma? No, but you need to be old enough to exhibit a, a, a pattern of recurrent respiratory symptoms. Um, so it's going to be at least six to 12 months uh, before you're going to have that time period to demonstrate that you have persistent cough or wheeze when you get sick with colds and stuff like that. Um, so it's more of a time issue, but there's no lower age limit. Okay, well, I think that's going to have to be where we cut off here, but Dr. Dave, I thank you so much. This has been fantastic. You should see all the comments in chat. Some said this is the best asthma webinar ever, so just super terrific. Thank you so much, and um, I look forward to working with you again. It's been a lot of fun today, and um, I, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much, Linda, and thank you all very much for taking time out of your lives to, to join us. Um, I hope this was helpful. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.